thought that the duty to consult was uh, probably uh, the topic that would convey a strong message uh, of uh, opening our eyes and new duties that are not entirely understood or implemented in our legal system. As you know, in many parts of the world, uh, indigenous peoples are still denied the duty to inform. So they even they are not consulted because they are not informed. And this is even more uh, fundamental. Uh, so let's not take for granted that the information, proper information, which is um, a requirement for meaningful consultation, is uh, is there. So I think uh, with that extraordinary opening, we can now move to the environmental rule of law. We have set up uh, very strict um, time limits. Um, it's wonderful because judges love <laughs> uh, setting up time limits for <laughs> others. But we are terrible in doing this with us and especially on implementing those. That's why we have third parties implementing that, uh, not, not, not judges. And um, so uh, we started 10 minutes late because we couldn't find our room. Um, and my <laughs> suggestion is that we begin immediately. And uh, I will pass uh, the microphone to the two co-chairs um, and uh, Andy Rain promised to be the toughest. Uh, I don't know if Justice Santeria, you know, she's always smiling, but she can be very tough too. So impose all the uh, your strict control on all of us. Uh, honorable Justices, uh, uh, Professors, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are so proud to. On? Yeah, Already, good. yeah. Thank you. We so, do have translation, incidentally. We are so proud that we can have a forum uh, this morning and talk about the uh, most important topic for the world. So, uh, firstly, I would like to express our sincere thanks to the World Jurist Association. Uh, let us celebrate uh, the 30th, uh, 60th uh, anniversary of the association and let us uh, convey our great uh, thanks to the host uh, of this event, the site event and the whole event. Uh, our topic today uh, is the peace through law. And in that spirit, this panel has been convened to discuss about the judicial perspectives on the responsibilities, challenges and trends for the judiciary in supporting this mission. Uh, more uh, special uh, for this uh, forum is that we don't talk only about the rights of the people, uh, but we will talk more about the right of the unborn people and the future generation. Moreover, uh, we will not talk only about human peace, but we will talk about the eco peace. So it's been the peace for uh, the river, the forest, and also for the climate. So let us uh, work together in this morning to bring our dream come true. Uh, I would like to ask Andy Rain, uh, the UNEP, uh, from the UNEP Law Division, to introduce our prominent uh, panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Justice Muan Puong. Uh, good morning, colleagues. My name is Andy Rain. I'm with the United Nations Environment Program in the Law Division, where I head our frontiers in environmental law work. And there's no greater frontier or indeed more important issue than the environmental rule of law. My job is simple. I'm the enforcer. I am to keep two people to time. Um, this morning, I looked up how long was the national anthem of Brazil. It is three minutes and 54 seconds. And our distinguished justices have four minutes. And so if one keeps that in, in your mind, if you're not familiar with the national anthem of Brazil, perhaps something closer to home, the Star Spangled Banner is a minute and a half. Two rounds of the Star Spangled Banner 
is the time you have for your interventions. We have six very distinguished justices um, from the highest courts of their countries, um, uh, all from the Global South. And so this is a truly uh, remarkable opportunity to hear their perspectives on what are the challenges uh, in implementing the environmental rule of law in their countries. The question to each of you is simple. It is to identify the burning challenge, the biggest challenge for environmental rule of law in your country. The way this will work is we'll have one round of interventions from each of the justices. Time permitting, we'll then have a second round uh, where we would invite you to flip the script and also share something more positive uh, on opportunities for environmental rule of law in your country. So with that, um, please let me pass it to the first speaker, which is uh, Justice Samuel uh, Azeno from the Supreme Court of the Dominican Republic. The floor is yours. Good morning. Es la única palabra en inglés que voy a, a dirigir. <laughs> <laughs> Quiero agradecer infinitamente la oportunidad que se me da de participar en este evento y lógicamente muchas gracias a al honorable Antonio Benjamín por su invitación. Trataré resumidamente de establecer algunas particularidades del derecho procesal ambiental en comparación con algunas ramas clásicas del derecho procesal. El éxito de una demanda de una acción en justicia estará garantizada en la medida en que el reclamante cumpla con las reglas procedimentales establecidas. No solo se trata del fondo del derecho sustantivo, la forma inadecuada de reclamar el derecho puede hacerlo perder el derecho sustantivo y el daño ambiental, como todos sabemos, puede ser fatal para la actual y las futuras generaciones. En el caso de mi país, no existe una jurisdicción especializada para tratar los asuntos ambientales. Y todos sabemos que otras ramas importantes del derecho, con características muy especializadas, tienen componentes importantes en lo que es el derecho ambiental. Me refiero, por ejemplo, al derecho constitucional, el derecho administrativo, el derecho penal, el derecho civil, entre otros. Estas ramas tradicionales del derecho ya tienen establecidos sus propios principios procesales, mediante los cuales pretende asegurar la precisión y la fuerza en la aplicación de la ley correspondiente a su determinada especialidad. Y podemos asegurar que, entonces, desde esa perspectiva, el gran peligro se presenta cuando los actores en el sistema de administración de justicia tratan de darle el mismo tratamiento exclusivo y propio de su área a la solución de los conflictos ambientales. Desde esta perspectiva, por citar un ejemplo que le parecerá raro a algunos, un juez acostumbrado a juzgar en materia penal le sería muy difícil aún conociendo la materia ambiental, desprenderse de un principio tan importante como lo es el indubio por reo para dar paso al indubio pro natura. Y aún cuando por lo general este principio se relaciona más bien con medidas cautelares, cito esta posibilidad porque a diferencia de otros países, la multa es en nuestro país una sanción penal, no civil. La aplicación estricta del derecho procesal penal podría favorecer al infractor ambiental. Por otra parte, en muchos aspectos el derecho ambiental requiere el manejo de umbrales de incertidumbre que necesariamente entran en tensión con los principios generales del derecho. Es lo que sucede cuando se aplica el principio de precaución que recoge nuestra ley en el sentido de que no podrá alegarse la falta de certeza científica absoluta como razón para no adoptar medidas preventivas y eficaces en todas las actividades que impacten negativamente al medio ambiente. 
en nuestro derecho, básicamente el juez de los referimientos tiene la costumbre de adoptar medidas provisionales para prevenir el daño inminente. En cuanto a la legitimación activa, el aspecto no es nada pacífico, es sumamente controversial y pudiera ser un obstáculo a la hora de accionar en justicia. Esto así porque en el derecho procesal ordinario a los fines de ejercer una acción en justicia es preciso que el accionante tenga un derecho provisto de acción, un interés personal y directo, la calidad, es decir, la titularidad, la facultad legal de actuar en justicia y la capacidad independientemente de que se trate de una persona física o jurídica. Pocas excepciones, estoy reduciendo, pocas excepciones escapan a este rigor procesal tradicional. Cabe destacar el caso de la Beas Corpus, una institución muy antigua en beneficio de una persona ilegalmente privada de su libertad. Huge apologies, huge apologies. I'm just going to alert um, our justices that we have an enforcer in front of us who's holding up a sign just to alert us how much time is left. And my sincere apologies. But just one minute left. See that one. <laughs> Sorry. But, oh, well. But it is in English. He, he, he can't understand. <laughs> <laughs> pues, eh, um, corresponde a un conjunto indeterminado de personas o lo que algunos llaman el derecho, el derecho sin sujeto. La clásica teoría del derecho procesal en la que existe un sujeto individual e identificable era una condición fundamental para la titularidad de la acción y esta se ve definitivamente alterada cuando hablamos de los derechos difusos. Paro aquí para evitar un... Thank you very, very much. And apologies for keeping to time, but um, time is against us. And our next speaker will keep that at the front of his brain as he uh, addresses us. He needs no introduction. Justice Benjamin is the architect, some would say, of the environmental rule of law as a term, as a concept, and as a driving force. And we are honored to now pass the floor to you, Justice Benjamin. Well, many thanks. I, I do hope not to give a professation. Is it? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Many thanks. I do hope not to give Professor Ishan the pleasure to show me the one minute uh, sign. I mean, you, he can show it, but it will be one minute. I still have one minute. <laughs> well, in those uh, three minutes, uh, I would like just to, to highlight a few points that I think are relevant when we discuss the environmental rule of law. This uh, panel is more on the general theory of the environmental rule of law. <clears throat> and then the second one, we will be discussing in detail um, a, a major component of that, which is judicial education on the environmental rule of law. So the question is, what is the rule of law? We take it for granted that we know it. But in order to really see how we as judges deal with the rule of law, we need at least to grasp the main components of the rule of law. Because if we keep ourselves to the most orthodox, traditional perception of the rule of law, we are not going to, to be good judges in adjudicating environmental cases. So the traditional way is to say that the rule of law is about having good procedures. Due process is one of them, the principle of innocence, and we could go on and on. And also to stress that it's about law, but in fact it can be any law. And we know that uh, um, in, in history we have had terrible uh, regimes that had very strict, clear, enforced laws, but they were exactly the opposite of what we have in mind. So the second component of the rule of law 
It's about substance. And that's where the controversies begin. Is it part, and my answer to save time is positive, is it part of the rule of law that we have to have good laws and what good laws are? Is the one minute uh, already? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not yet, <laughs> but you know, Andy Rain is threatening me with this uh, piece of paper and I'm, I'm already traumatized. <laughs> so the second, this second component is crucial for the qualification that UNEP, the Global Judicial Institute of the Environment, the uh, World Commission on Environmental Law, and the other partners have given since 2012 to the rule of law, calling it the environmental rule of law. So that's about procedure and uh, prior consent or consultation. Uh, any information is about procedure, um, but it's beyond that. It's about good laws. I end because now I have my one minute with a couple of questions. Does the environmental rule of law also requires or includes a duty to legislate? And some courts have said, yes, it does require a duty to legislate. And if this is not complied, judges have a rule to play a role to play. And the second is, does the rule of, and especially the environmental rule of law, requires judge to do things that are different? And I think my dear colleague and friend from uh, the uh, Dominican Republic has already uh, answered this question. Yes, we cannot adjudicate those cases in the same manner. I stop here. I think I'm precisely within my time limit. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Justice Benjamin. Our next speaker is Justice Sapana Mala from the Supreme Court of Nepal. You have the floor. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. Environmental law matters to each of us, and I think environmental rule of law is in our heart. For years in our reason we struggled to bring the law. Public interest litigation was quite instrumental in expanding the law in the absence of, uh, ex absence of constitution, uh, expand the rights in the absence of law, uh, but it has also helped us to bring the law in place. Yes, law is critical, but having law is not enough. Um, Unless environmental rule of law is strengthened, as Justice Antonio mentioned, it's very important. Otherwise, the right to environment will be unfulfilled. And the first global uh, assessment of environmental rule of law has indicated that uh, there's an enforcement uh, challenge. And uh, yes, in the implementation of envi environmental law, we are facing multi layers of challenges. That is in forms of horizontal, vertical, and judiciary has been playing critical role in transforming laws in the in the in the realization, but ju judiciary is itself facing uh, difficulties uh, in establishing harm, lacks research evidence connection with the science, trained personnel, lacks technical expertise and adequate financing. Implementation often suffers from inadequate coordination, overlapping rules, jurisdictional conflict. Corruption within the regulatory body and government agency has been undermining the implementation. Delays in legal pro proceeding is also affecting timely resolution of environmental disputes. So in the effort to balance economic development with environmental protection has been leading to conflicting interests and priorities. Development projects has been pressurizing government to relax environmental regulations to facilitate development and economic growth. Yes, law requires ways of minimizing or stopping negative effect on environment, and EI is a tool to ensure the in, in, that environmental concerns are considered from the very beginning of the development. But in most recent case of airport construction, which was written by Justice Anand, who is before me, a large scale of national projects were that relied on massive destruction of protected forest area and diversity. The importance of EIA has been extensively discussed and made authorities 
conducting EIA accountable, ladies and gentlemen. Making authorities accountable in EIA is essential for environmental rule of law. Court held that the cutting down of trees covering 8,000 hectare land would be disastrous and appropriate alternative must be sought to construction of the airport. Fake and de deficient EIA is challenged in environmental rule of law. Court order to take necessary measure with proper EIA to ensure that development does not damage the environment. The bench thus quashed all the decision of the government made in this regard, citing the importance <coughs> of precautionary principle and the importance of function of EIA in reducing harm of development work. The primary obstacle at the moment to the rule of law reform are not technical for, or financial, but more <coughs> political and human. Those environmental decisions that might have political ramification or might run against corrupt interests, there is a serious threat to the independence of judiciary. And the sad reality of the world is that the idea of environmental justice is against development it still exists. It is critical to communicate with the responsible agency, with the government. Development is not a project. It's a process. Court needs to be loud and clear that and that in no condition we can compromise with quality of EIA. EIA should be able to measure socioeconomic and ecological variables, should be able to give alternatives to minimize the harm, should be able to create resolution to restore the harm. Yes, we need to communicate. Court is not against development. We stand and we have to be loud for ecological sustainable development. I reiterate, there is no true development in the, just, in the destruction of environment. Thank you. Many thanks, Justice Malan. Our next speaker is Justice Sergio Munoz, former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Chile. And Justice Munoz, you have the floor. Muchas gracias. Trataré de hablar rápido para aprovechar el tiempo. Primero fue identificar que existía un, una necesidad de regular especialmente el medio ambiente. Posteriormente surgió la necesidad de encontrar esas reglas y principios para proteger el medio ambiente o regularlo. Posteriormente, fue plasmar en declaraciones, principios, luego normas nacionales e internacionales que protegieran este medio ambiente. El paso siguiente fue que los tribunales aplicaran estas reglas que se habían generado por los especialistas en relación con el medio ambiente. Hoy estamos en este estado que los tribunales apliquen, el medio ambiente, apliquen las normas medioambientales a los casos que se le presentan. Creo que ya hay legislación suficiente, tanto eh, regular en cada uno de los estados, como el soft law en las declaraciones que se han hecho. En este momento... Estamos en una etapa decisiva que los jueces realmente cumplan la letra y el espíritu de la ley. Surge aquí como insumo indispensable el principio o los principios, las normas, cómo se orienta la aplicación del derecho. Y es así como se hablaba de aspectos sustanciales y aspectos procedimentales o procesales. En los aspectos sustanciales encontramos que ya no es una opción de la autoridad el cumplimiento de las normas medioambientales. Debe coordinarse para dar protección a todas y todos dentro de un Estado. Ya lo hemos descubierto tempranamente en Argentina con el caso Riachuelo, y en otras determinaciones que han emitido los tribunales nacionales en América Latina. Pero también, eh, debiendo citar los tribunales estadounidenses y la Corte Suprema de Estados, Unidos, de Estados Unidos, ha dicho que en medio ambiente hay exclusión cero, es decir, 
no puede dejar de aplicarse ninguna norma medioambiental porque todas son necesarias para proteger el medio ambiente. Y por lo tanto, esta norma, que es llamada en un caso determinado, no puede ser obviada de aplicación. Y es aquí como irvanamos inmediatamente con el hecho de que se ha ido adentrando en nuestro quehacer la norma de quién contamina paga, pero posteriormente quién contamina descontamina por cuanto eso es más caro y ha surgido lo que es el reemplazo o la afectación de la naturaleza por naturaleza. Quien destruye un bosque no solo tiene el deber de pagar todas las sanciones correspondientes, sino que debe reforestar en el mismo lugar y no utilizar en otra forma ese sitio. Además, no es necesario que estén protegidas todas y cada una de las, eh, de las especies dentro de nuestro entorno para tener protección por los tribunales sino que es la necesidad de darle protección. Los glaciares, los humedales eh, y las especies más eh, importantes y que están en extinción deben ser protegidas por los tribunales. Bueno, vienen muchas cosas que están relacionadas con la, con la participación y otras normas, a ver si en la segunda ronda puedo eh, referirme a ella, pero hay algo que debemos decir de inmediato. Los tribunales como dice Marta Nasbaum, son la última frontera. Y debemos estar claros que debemos tener un desarrollo sustentable porque del desarrollo sustentable depende el mundo que queremos y el mundo que vamos a dejar en la justicia transgeneracional a las generaciones venideras. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, uh, Justice Muñoz. Our next speaker is somebody who lives in the country that I do, in Kenya, in beautiful Kenya, Justice Samson Okongo, no longer in Nairobi, sadly. He has moved to the, to the beautiful shores of, of Lake Victoria, as I understand it. But Justice Okongo is uh, a former president of the Environment and Land Court of Kenya and is currently serving on that court, and we're delighted to now pass the floor to you. Thank you very much, Chair. From the definition of uh, env what environmental rule of law is, that was given by Justice Antonio, I could gather a few elements of uh, what the environmental rule of law is. I got a fair, clear, and in implementable environmental laws public participation, access to justice, accountability, and integrity of institutions and decision makers. From uh, my jurisdiction, where I come from, we have what I would describe as a ideal legal atmosphere for the enforcement of environmental rights, duties, and obligations. And uh, what? why do I say ideal? We have a constitution that guarantees a right to a clean and safe environment. We have a constitution that gives standing to anyone in the enforcement of a right to a clean and safe environment. We have a framework law on environmental management and coordination, in addition to other many sectoral laws. We also have a constitution that makes all treaties and conventions on environmental law to which Kenya is a signatory and general rules of international law part of the Kenyan law. So we can tap in from the international treaties on environmental law. We also have a, a specialized court that is the Environment and Land Court uh, that deals with mainly uh, environment and uh, land disputes. In addition to that, in addition to a specialized court, we have uh, 
we have a tribunal which is established under the framework law that handles disputes relating to development planning. Uh, we have challenges. What I can say is that these outstanding procedural and substantive laws for the enforcement and enhance, uh, enforcement of environmental rights have not translated to a remarkable enhancement in the environmental rule of law in our jurisdiction. The main problem that we now face, uh, we have good constitution, good substantive law, uh, good, uh, our, we have a specialized court, but the problem now that we have as a court or as a country is that uh, we have reluctance on the part of the public to actually bring environmental claims or disputes to our court and to the specialized tribunal that is supposed to deal with them. So we have the laws, we have the courts, we have a, num a, a number of judges. Uh, the judges were initially 15, they have now, the number has increased to 51. But now what we have is that there are no environmental cases to do. Out of the cases that come to our court, 95% are actually land cases, environmental cases are only 5%. So we have a number of strategies that due to time constraint in this presentation, I can't go to, but we have a lot of strategies we have put in place to ensure that we have a number of uh, environment uh, disputes being brought to our court. The other challenge is the enforcement of environmental related court orders and decrees, uh, particularly where the enforcement is supposed to be undertaken by the government. Uh, again, there's a big challenge there, but again, we have a number of strategies we have put in place to ensure that uh, court orders and the decrees are enforced. I can see my time is up. Thank you very much. <laughs> Very impressed with this judicial discipline. This is this is very impressive. Our final speaker in in this first round is uh, just to my left, um, Justice Maria Singh, who is the newest member of the Supreme Court of the Philippines, but a judge with a long and deep bench of history and experience, 22 years as a judge. Uh, Justice Singh, please over to you. Thank you very much, Andy, and good morning to everyone. I see that the cross-cutting issue um, among all of these jurisdictions is the gap in enforcement and application. And I will just add one thing to that, compliance. So we ask ourselves earlier, Justice Kennedy of the United States Supreme Court said, it seems that many people notice, but very few people care. And so I ask, why is there no sense of urgency? Why is it even among us judges, it's only the judges who handle environmental cases who really feel passionate about it? If it's really a crisis, why isn't everybody afraid? Why is it only us? Here in this room today, why are there only so few of us? So why? And then the bigger question also is, why are cases not being filed? Or if cases are filed, why do do they not succeed? If they succeed, why is there no reparation or restoration? Why is this the common scenario in most of our countries? And the other big question is, is there really a deterrent effect? Do we feel a deterrent effect to all these laws that we have? And so in my studies, I attribute it to two big things. But first we ask ourselves, we have the laws, but why are the laws not enough? The first thing I want to mention is the lack of consciousness or awareness among the general citizenry. Why don't they comply with the laws? Simply, they are unaware that there, that there are certain duties and responsibilities on their part. The very simple, the very simple uh, part of not not polluting their environment, not throwing their trash in our bodies of water, or the slash and burn, 
these things are fundamental to their consciousness. They do these things because they are simply unaware that this thing should not be done because they have terrible consequences. President Iresha earlier referred to the heat wave. We, we see the people on television being interviewed about how it is now to be in Rome. And yet, it's just something that they encounter during this trip. It's not something that will change their lifestyle at all. It, because of the lack of consciousness of their rights and their duties, that is also contributory to the lack of cases being filed in courts. And then the second one, which I think is a big issue, at least for my jurisdiction, is the fragmentation in the implementation and application. You have several agencies or offices of the government that are involved in implementation and application of the laws, but they do not communicate with each other. They each focus on their respective jurisdictions or authorities. They do not talk to each other. There is inefficiency. There is duplication. There is a wastage of government resources. But worse, worse of all is that what the judge is expecting to see in the evidence is not what the law enforcers build up. It's not also what the prosecutors present. So the simple, the simple answer to that is communication, adopt the sector approach, which we are trying in our jurisdiction. The trainings are done as a sector. We don't train the judges alone. We train the judges together with the law enforcers and the prosecutors. The law enforcers and the prosecutors build up the cases together. And the most important aspect, the community is part of all of it. When the community is conscious, once the community is aware of what, are, what can be done and what should not be done, the community will be our first line, our frontliners, in saying this should stop. And they go to the authorities and say this is being done. It should be put to a stop. So I'll stop here because I'm beside the two enforcers. <laughs> I might be. <laughs> Thank you so much. In our notes, it says we're to summarize it, but I think you, in your intervention, have really hit the, the absolute crucial issue and the challenge before all of us and all of the interventions um, uh, pointed to this disconnect uh, between laws on the books and the reality on the ground. Um, but that is indeed the opportunity of environmental rule of law. And with that, I'd like to now open it up for a quick round of uh, reflections and additional comments. Looking at the time, it's now 11.30. This is due to end at uh, 11.45. Um, so we do, we do have 10 minutes or so uh, for a second round of comments and reflections. I'm going to look across the line to see who would like to put their hand up first, and I can see our justice from Nepal. <laughs> and maybe Please. before Justice Mal, I would like to reflect uh, 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 my view. So I think you all try hard to uh, develop your uh, your jurisprudence and also your institutions. That was great, and we, you know, Thailand and many countries follow your ways, you know, and. Uh, However, I think um, in some countries, especially for the civil law country, like our country, so we always find a restriction or limitation because I always appreciate when New Zealand, uh, you know, uh, set the ruling that uh, the river has the right uh, to sue, you know, the Wanganui River <coughs> has the right to sue, for example, or the Philippines, uh, you have like uh, set uh, the new model of the mandamas, uh, continuing mandamas, something like that. But in civil law country, we always need to wait for the good law. So I don't know uh, how about these uh, limitations that you, some countries have this uh, challenge or not. And another topic that I would like to hear from you all, uh, uh, Justice Mala said that uh, she brought many justices to the forest and uh, talk with the 
uh, community leaders, you know, with uh, poachers, uh, local people, and you know, it's like you work with the the real people. You know, you 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 have like meaningful participation of the people with your process. And in our country, maybe we are like the privileged group, and we are in our comfort zone. So how can we work well with the upstream and downstream people? So I'd like to hear from you all also. Thank you very much. I think I would like to touch upon because what has uh, haunted me in this debate is like from two different countries, from Philippines and from Kenya, what we heard like there is a law, there is an institution, uh, but there is no cases. And, 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 that, um, and, and in Nepal, we, we have a large number of cases and we have a huge backlog even with environmental related uh, cases issues. So what helped us to uh, bring the cases, the public interest litigation, and opening up locus standi uh, to, the, to anyone um, who have a substantial nexus and relation to the issue? So that is one thing I think uh, very important. And second is um, um, uh, in information, like um, just a single mention, like sharing the information about available law, about uh, right, about uh, remedies is critical. So in how to empower uh, the right holder uh, is, is equally important. And my other third intervention is, uh, because we were supposed to talk about the positive uh, things also, and what has been helping in Nepal, because we are not only confronting with implementation of law, um, in judiciary, but we are also confronting with implementation of our own judgment, especially in relation to environmental justice. So one um, uh, strategy which we have been uh, using at the moment is contempt of court. And it has really been helpful. I have no time to go into detail, but it has been able to bring the implementation strategy, and it has also been able to bring due diligence in our previous cases. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Mala. Um, I have requests from the floor from, from two of our justices, from uh, Antonio Benjamin, Justice Antonio Benjamin, and also from uh, uh, Justice Azeno. Um, Justice Benjamin, can I pass to you first and then to Justice Azeno, if that's okay? Well, thank you. I think this was a fantastic uh, round of uh, presentations. And uh, in my first round, I'm, uh, I mentioned to you, that, uh, just reminded you of the two main pillars of the rule of law and the environmental rule of law, the more traditional one, the procedural, and then uh, this whole universe of the substance of the rule of law. But in my view, there are two more pillars and very, very critical for the environmental rule of law. And one is implementation enforcement. Because you, in other areas of law, contract law, torts, etc., we can have the two pillars, and that's fine. If no cases come, if the law is not used, but not in the environmental rule of law. So this is the third pillar, in my view, and I have written about it. And the fourth pillar is about measurement, and I don't know if Michel Prie is here, um, somewhere he, he, he is, uh, or at least he was here. Um, so we, in the environmental rule of law, need to permanently measure the results of judicial implementation, of administrative implementation, otherwise it will be just law. And I end with two comments that um, um, I heard in the opening. Um, my, my brother Igreja said, silence today is complicity. And I asked him, is this from Pope Francis? Uh, who said this? He said me. Okay, <laughs> so from this point on, I think we can say that in the past, silence could be omission and co could be complacency. I don't know if in English is this correct word. 
complacence. Um, now, it is complicity. Uh, and then I connect this with what Tom Clark said, and he has the question, are we, uh, he didn't ask the, ask the question so openly, but we are in a war against nature and against indigenous people. And are we judges part of this war or are we part of the solution? I think that's uh, the dilemma, but the, the fundamental questions that we have to ask about the environment, the rule of law, and the role of judges. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Benjamin. <laughs> Justice Zeno, can I pass it to you, please? Gracias. Lo mío será sumamente breve. La verdad es que me, me, me impactó mucho las palabras de María Filomena sobre la preocupación y en mi caso me llega más hondo porque en realidad nosotros no tenemos tribunales especializados de medio ambiente. Y es penoso como en realidad esta materia es como tan olvidada. ¿Quién real y efectivamente está preocupado por el medio ambiente? ¿Qué tanto estamos los jueces que de una manera u otra nos toca actuar a veces sin ni siquiera las herramientas y la capacitación? Sencillamente eh, quería retomar ese, ese sentir porque creo que lo más importante eh, va en dos sentidos cuando se refiere a jueces. En primer lugar, la capacitación. Es sumamente importante que los jueces nos capacitemos, pero también tiene que ir acompañado con la sensibilización de que aquí no le estamos jugando todo. Uh, thank you very much. I have the request for the floor from my left, Justice Singh, and then to our justice from Chile. Thank you. Just something very quick. The panel is entitled Judges in the Environmental Rule of Law. What is really the rule of judges in this? And I think that we should uh, not be caught up in the traditional role of judges, which is just to adjudicate. We have to be more involved in this because we are the ones who understand, we are the ones that, who, who have the knowledge and the skills, but also the, the urgency of the situation. We are the ones who are in the best position to communicate this. So like what we're doing now, what Justice Benjamin has been doing, putting things together so that we can spread spread the words, spread the, spread the knowledge. That is something that judges do not traditionally do. And if we do, we do it in the normal, in the normal place, which is in law schools. We teach law students, but we can teach other people who do not want to be lawyers. We can go down and teach the community so how they can be a big part of this. And so I think that we have to start moving out of our comfort zone, as mentioned by uh, Justice uh, Santaria, we have to start thinking of our job in a different way. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Singh. Justice Munoz. <coughs> tres, tres ideas solamente. Lo primero es que debemos encauzarnos en nuestro quehacer para entender que la naturaleza ya no es un objeto de derecho, sino que es un sujeto de derecho. En segundo lugar, eh, debemos eh, evitar la proliferación de acciones judiciales que sean antagónicas para proteger el medio ambiente, pero hay que tener en claro que las acciones de tutela constitucional siempre serán procedentes para detener lo que es la afectación del medio ambiente. Y por último, que un desarrollo sustentable no se opone a los proyectos de inversión, sino que lo único que buscan es encauzar que estos proyectos de inversión respeten la naturaleza. Yo creo que no hay que ver como un aspecto que se está haciendo fuego entre él, sino que tienen que ir de la mano. Y el desarrollo también es bueno, como también es bueno preservar la naturaleza. Mm. 
Muchas gracias, Justice Munoz. Can I see if anyone else would like the floor? Samson, over to you. Thank you, uh, Chair. The only thing I want to add is uh, that as judges, we must be very, very innovative when it comes to enforcement of uh, our orders and uh, decrees. As my colleague had mentioned, one of the ways that has been used is to use contempt to enforce orders. But what we have found useful in our jurisdiction is um, what I would call uh, structural interdicts, whereby once you deliver judgment on an environmental matter that need to be enforced, like we have had uh, a case of lead poisoning of a very large area, and we made an order for uh, environmental restoration. What we, you need then to do is not just to give a judgment, make an order for environmental restoration and leave it there. You, we made orders that uh, the government should come up with a plan of action, form a committee, multi-sectoral, bring it to court. Then that committee should come up with a plan. Then gr it is graduated until you know such a time that the cleaning is actually done so that has become very very useful in our jurisdiction and uh, it may help when you have such cases thank you thank you justice Congo. Um, i'm going to pass to my co-chair for any uh, reflections we are coming to time um, so please to you yeah so i think we have like great ambition that we need to achieve not only the human peace, but also the, the equal peace. So I think uh, everything that we have done together, even in your own jurisdictions, but we share, we exchange our ideas, our experiences. And this is a very good forum that we learn from each other. And it's not, we did not start, we don't start today, we have started long times ago and we will work join hand and work together in the future very closely and uh, I'd like to thank everyone that you would join us it's a pity that we cannot have time to hear from you all and yeah um, I hope that we will meet again and we will develop our ideas our knowledge and uh, we must respect our uh, ethics that we need to be to have integrity and I believe that the intellectual integrity that we need to develop our wisdom and our practices so I thank you all very much indeed and from my side please let me um, express my profound gratitude um, for a very very interesting discussion a very useful discussion the topic was on environmental rule of law generally, but I think this discussion has helped us unpack it, understand it somewhat. Obviously, a much longer discussion is to be had. I had dinner with my good friend from the Asian Development Bank, Briony, last night, and I think we worked ourselves into a bit of despair. To your point, we're in an urgent crisis, and it's a very, very difficult concept to navigate emotionally. But it's these sorts of forums that, that provide a platform to give solidarity, a platform to, to address it together. So please let me pay tribute to, to again to Justice Benjamin for making the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment a reality. And, you, and from UNIT's perspective, and I know I speak for ADB as well and for all the other partners, we're so proud and so grateful that we can be with you on this journey. And we really want to provide that space for you and to use these platforms of the UN, of the Asian Development Bank, of the Institute, to really help us achieve that challenge and that mission that you've uh, so eloquently laid out. So with that, again, thank you to all the panelists, and I now pass it to Justice Benjamin. Thank you to you. Oh, um, um, I would ask you to join me in thanking the two coaches. Thank you.